Welcome to Monster Chats, presented by Monster VoIP, where we share the tools, methods, and best practices that business leaders use to build new connections, strengthen relationships, and impact sales and organizations of all shapes and sizes. If you have any questions that come up during today's episode, please text them to 424-378-6966. Please welcome the founder of Monster VoIP, your host, Colin Mitchell. On today's episode, we're going to be talking with Ian Koniak of Salesforce. Ian and I are going to be talking about going from good to great in sales, overcoming professional and personal obstacles to reach your highest potential, and using stories to sell. The power of focus. My name is Colin Mitchell. I'm the founder of Monster VoIP and your host of Monster Chats. Welcome to Monster Chats, Ian. How are you doing? Great, Colin. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, Ian has sold over a hundred million at fortune 500 companies. Ian is a leading expert in sales whose global client list includes Berkshire Hathaway, Activision and task us through a massive commitment to alignment, vision and purpose. He has held countless positions as the number one sales person, including the number one account executive and enterprise division of Salesforce a billion dollar global company with more than 40,000 employees worldwide. Thanks. <laughs> wow. Ian, tell us, I mean, uh, tell, that tells us a little bit more about you professionally, but tell us a little bit more about your story in, in, in personally. Yeah. Um, on the personal side, I live in LA. I've kind of grew, grown up here and um, I, I didn't really necessarily want to go into sales growing up. I, my mom is a professor at UCLA and she was always education first and wanted me to be a lawyer, a doctor. And I really just liked to travel. So when I, when I finished college, I went to school up in Berkeley. I, I decided to go down to South America for a year and teach English. And I was living on a shoestring budget and I was traveling all around and it was a, an amazing year. Uh, and when that ended, I had to go back to, to Los Angeles and, in Venezuela, I had actually fallen in, in love with somebody and, and we couldn't be together unless I was to uh, make enough money to go and bring her to uh, the United States and put her through college because the only visas you can get from Venezuela are student visas. And so I, at the ripe age of 23, I was back living with my parents, no money, no job. And I'm like, what can I do to to save up this this money and be with the person you know that I love at the time, and so that's what got me into sales originally. And I've been now doing sales for this is my 18th year, and in, um, in two companies at, at Rico for for 10 years, and and this is my eighth year at, at Salesforce.com. So it's been a it's been a great ride. Wow, talk about some pressure to sell, huh? That's right, always. I guess that was your that was your why at the moment. Yeah, back then it was, and you know when when you're Always, uh, when, when you don't have another option, when you have to succeed, when you don't have a fallback plan, it, it's amazing. The, uh, you don't question what you're doing every day. You do what you need to do, and you don't question. There's not a lot of motivation needed to get up and do the hard work. And so that's, that was an early lesson that I, I learned in, in sales is you can't think about what you're trying to do. You need to know what it is that will make you successful and execute and execute and execute. Cause I think there's so much distraction and it's so easy, you know, sales, you're really running your own business. And I think unless you really have that mindset of, you know, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Here's exactly what it needs to take to be successful, knowing your, you know, your focus areas, and um, being able to have a, a, you know, a, the, right, the right discipline combined with the right work ethic and skill, I, you can't really fail if you're in sales and you have those things going. But where I see most people just fall short is they, they don't have the right motivation. They think it's for money. They think it's for um, mm -hmm. status or recognition. But the reality is you have to have something outside of yourself to truly perform at your highest level. You can't just be relying on it. You've got to have someone else. You've got to have, it could be your faith. It could be your family. It could be um, a goal that you really set as far as um, maybe the home you want to buy, but you have to have something outside of yourself or else the motivation typically is not going to be at its highest 
uh, level for, for anyone. That's just the rule that I've discovered in life. So I'm always kind of recalibrating each year to, you know, to, to refine my why. That's, that's something I do every year. Right. Yeah. I mean, once, cause once you hit that, then you got to reset and refocus and be chasing something else to, you know, continue to have that drive every day. Exactly. And if you're only chasing one thing, here's, here's the mix. What I'm learning and, and I'm, I'm on kind of a spiritual journey now, Colin. So I might go a number of ways with this, this podcast, but what, yeah. what I'm learning now is if you're always chasing, and this is from COVID and all the stuff that is happening, you're never going to enjoy the ride if you're, if you're never at your destination. So mm-hmm. let's say you just have a, a goal to hit a home right? And you're chasing and chasing, you, you get that dream home that you wanted. Then you say, what's next? Well, maybe I want to, in my case, put in a backyard and a pool and all these material things and chasing, chasing. Okay, what's next? Well, the whole time you're chasing, are you truly appreciating and being present to where you are? And mm. so I've kind of had to learn the hard ways. I've always been chasing I, I, for performance and for being, um, I'd say motivated and driven and, and really, really, uh, you know, just having that internal drive. It's great to have those goals, but there is a risk in, in doing that, that you don't necessarily um, smell the roses along the way on, mm. on that path. And when you get there, it could be very disappointing because you're like, all that work, all that effort, was it worth it? It's just a house. So now mm. I'm, I'm kind of looking within and really trying to find out well, what is this, this life you know, really what is life all about? And, and it's interesting. My, my direction shifted quite a bit um, in the past, I would say, uh, past few years. And as I, as I try to figure out, you know, what, what is the meaning of life? I just turned 40 and it's like, it just set me on a different course. That's for sure. <laughs> no, yeah, no, that's incredible. I, I, I've definitely struggled with the same thing myself, always chasing a goal and then hitting it. And it's like, now what's next? And you, you forget to enjoy the journey uh, along the way. For um, sure. And, 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 and you start to gain a, an appreciation for the journey. Um, so, but tell us what it means to go from being good to great in sales, right? How, how do you, how have you been able to get into these fortune 500 companies and yeah. drive a conversation, um, in a meaningful way? Yeah, I think, um, it's a, it's a really, really hard question because there's a number of things that go into selling at a very high level. I'll preface this by saying I failed before I was successful. Mm. I failed for three years in a row. As far as, you know, my, my past three years in Salesforce, I've been a top performer and now I'm doing trainings for the company and coaching and all this great stuff, but it wasn't always that way. In fact, uh, what I, um, experience was was really really disappointing, and I used to beat myself up because I couldn't really figure out the the way to crack the code of of really performing at the highest level in the major leagues of sales, which is software. Enterprise software is the major league. If you're in sales, I would encourage anyone to to sell enterprise software because there is no limit to to the impact you can make and and the you know the the success you can have financially, professionally, growth wise. It's just always, always challenging. And the, the big difference for me between those years that I failed and, and the years that I was successful is something shifted. Uh, having sold copiers, I did a lot of activity with a lot of people. It wasn't a very strategic selling cycle. It was very simple. You go out to their offices, you look at what they're using as far as their copiers and printers and faxes, which people had back in the day, and you add up mm-hmm. all the costs for their leases and their supplies. And you say, hey, I can do better. I'll give you a bunch of new equipment and I'll include the toner and the service. And, you know, you pay a fixed monthly fee and it's going to be 20, 30% less and you'll have all new equipment. Well, that was a proposition most CFOs couldn't say no to or most CIOs. It was really easy. Um, if you did the activity and you had the right approach, you could be successful. Well, when mm-hmm. it comes to software or consulting or any kind of service that you're providing where you're changing someone's fundamental business, that does not work. And so I took this, mm-hmm. you know, high transaction, high volume approach, took it to Salesforce and expected it to really yield the same kind of results that um, I, you know, got in copiers and it, and it didn't. And so the big shift for me was focus more on fewer people to drive meaningful conversations and bigger impact. 
focusing less on more people does not work in the high volume in in the strategic enterprise sales game. So that's where I was doing a lot of transactions at Salesforce and I was busting my tail trying to close business and it felt like a grind. In the past three, four years, I feel like a trusted advisor because I'm spending a lot of time and at every stage of the sales cycle, th this applies. It's, it's um, what, for example, prospecting. You asked about getting in the door. If I want to meet with the CEO or COO, before I ever reach out to that person, what I'm going to do is I'm going to understand what it is that their company is being tasked with right now. What are their top priorities? I'll read their annual report and I'll see what their CEO is saying and I'll see what they're saying if they're cited there. Then I'll go in their LinkedIn. I'll see what um, specific um, posts they might have or what they follow and see what's interesting to them. Not from just a personal shoot the shit level of, hey, you, you're a Rams fan, so am I. That, that doesn't, execs don't want that. The every other person's doing that. So you're going you're to quickly lose, um, lose them if you create that meaningless small talk. I'm talking about what is most important to you in your business and you personally, and then go on their, um, the news and really look at how they've been interviewed. I'll watch their interviews. I'll watch anything. Uh, maybe maybe they, gave a, um, you know, they gave a speech somewhere and, or a keynote. Most of the time, these executives are very public. You can do a lot of right. research and you can see what they're saying. So before I ever reach out, I'll probably spend several hours of who am I targeting, what's important, and I'll build a point of view on where I think we can help them. Then when I reach out, it's a very specific message. If I saw you are trying to drive employee you know, engagement and employee satisfaction in, in the work from home environment. Companies now are trying to find new ways to connect with their employees because they don't have the physical offices where they can you know, connect in their cultures. Can I talk to you about ways we can create digital experiences that drive um, community uh, in, in some of our customers, such as X, Y, and Z customer, and I'll name some relevant stories. So that message is tailored. I'll show a link to um, you know, a clip that I saw. I'll grab a quote from them. The people who do this are the ones who are successfully getting the meeting. Because even if they're not necessarily interested, the fact that you took the time and you understand what's important to them, they're going to respect that. And, and the key is then tying it back to how you can help them. So I said, we can help you build community in a work from home environment. That's very relevant now. So mm -hmm. you need to be personalized. You need to be relevant. You need to show respect. You need to be mindful of their time and you need to be direct, right? Don't be intimidated because they are a CEO, right? When I'm mm -hmm. talking to you, I'm talking to a founder of a company. It doesn't matter. People are people. We all put on our pants the same way. And I think reps and in sales in, in general get intimidated by titles or by, by um, but at the end of the day, people don't want that. People don't want people sucking up to them. They want people to challenge them. Executives mm -hmm. want you to challenge them. They want you to bring value and tell them something they don't know. So the more you can research and respectfully um, reach out with a message that, that's relevant and resonates, the better equipped you're going to be. And, and that goes throughout the entire sales cycle, throughout not just the first hook, but once you meet with them, really listening and engaging and, and, um, and with empathy, right? Your, your mm -hmm. kids are, um, you know, uh, five, four, and, and 18 months. I, I picked that up. You live where you live. This is not because I am just trying to make small talk. It's because I'm genuinely trying to connect. So that last piece is authenticity. You have to be yourself. And, and I do these videos on LinkedIn and, you know, it's just me. I'm not trying to be a, do a perfect production. I'm not trying to be something I'm not. What I'm trying to do is bring value to the people watching these videos. Not to, I mean, it's partially for myself. I shouldn't say it's purely for other people, but I don't have my business launched yet. I don't have a direct thing that I can give people where I'm trying to sell them anything. I genuinely am trying to add value. And then when I do eventually do, do coaching full time, um, you know, I'll have people that know I, I'm credible. So it, it needs to be from a place of service. So the, the key things, I just said a lot, but the key takeaways, how do we do this? How do you go from good to great? Mm -hmm. Are you, you focus more on fewer people, you, you research and you personalize your communications, you solve problems that are mat matter to them and, and are relevant, you are authentic in terms of your communication and you really truly focus on serving first and then selling later. Those are kind of the five 
tips I would tell anyone mm. in sales that that are um, struggling to kind of cross that that threshold into the next level of their success. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, that's amazing, and I really like the piece that you said. Um, you know, where we're all people, right? We all put our pants on the same way. I think it's 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 so true that you know a lot of sales professionals um, can't get over that fear of reaching out to those enterprise level accounts that you've been able to have a lot of success with. That's right. That's right. And, and I mean, that's where connection comes from, you know, in, in life experience too. I mean, it's, you know, if you can relate to people cause you're a parent, if you can relate to them cause you've, uh, you know, started a company, if you can relate to them because you've run a sales team. I mean, the more experience you can get, the mm-hmm. more you have to fall back on to um, connect with them, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's interesting because you can't really teach that, but people ask, you know, well, how do you get really good really quick? You, you need to freaking fail really fast. Yeah, and yeah. You need to get a lot of experience because at the end of the day, that's where this connection comes from. It, and, and, and if you don't have that, you can still connect by solving those problems, by truly being a, a vessel for, for their company and, and, and putting them first. But connecting that personal level and really, you know, having that eye to eye conversation with the CEO um, comes from being comfortable with CEOs. It comes from being comfortable with uh, the the executives where you feel like you are one of them, not that they are above you and you're talking up to them. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that really does come from the, the view that we're all people and I have value. You have to know your own value. You have to know your own worth before you can truly get comfortable. And that's something that just, you know, I, I struggled a long time with that until I finally realized, holy shit, I know what I'm doing and I know it really well. And if you don't want to work with me, that's fine. That's on, right. that's your loss. And, and I, that's how I approach sales now. It's, I'm not attached to any kind of um, outcome. It, it really is. I'm here to serve. If, if, if you're not, you know, willing and able to work with me, that's totally fine. I'll find someone who is. So you've mm-hmm. got to be willing to able to let go and say no to the, the wrong opportunities and not because that's where the qualifying and, and that, that's where that becomes really important. Yeah. And, and I like, you know, what you said is, is spend more time with less people, right? So you talked a lot about doing a lot of research before reaching, even reaching out for the first time. How, how much time would you, will you typically spend doing your homework, doing your research and crafting that, that initial message for somebody that you maybe have had very little or no contact with? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, I have two accounts. I have uh, Experian, which is the, the data company that does all the credit checks and consumer services. And um, I have Berkshire Hathaway home services. So for me, if I'm reaching out, you know, each one of them might have 10 C-level executives. So that's 20 people. So it, it's not, uh, you got to get it right. You got to get the message right because it's not like, um, mm-hmm. You know, it's not like I have other accounts to fall back on, right? When I was in transactions, I can go to anyone, any door, anywhere, uh, and, and, and on to the next one. So I really didn't, that's the difference between transactional and strategic selling is I didn't have a big territory to go after. So I would say if you have a big territory to go after, if you have a lot of accounts, you spend a little less time, right? Mm-hmm. But when you're in the enterprise space and you only have a few accounts, or if you're in any kind of software, um, it doesn't just go for you know, for enterprise, I think, you know, there's the 80, 20 rule, 80% of the business comes from 20% of the customers, right? 80% of the results come from 20% of the reps. And that, that Mm -hmm. seems to reign true for forever. And so you got to spend more time with that, that, uh, you know, that 20% instead of where people spend a lot more time with, with the 80%. So to, to answer your question directly, you know, per person, I'll probably spend two, three hours researching. I'll watch videos. Um, I'll, I'll watch, you know, it's not just like, to read an annual report takes a lot of time because you're not just yeah. reading, you're, you're writing down all the the takeaways. And then, and then I have a team of 20 people that I run. So I have, I have reps from companies like Tableau and MuleSoft and Salesforce has acquired a lot of companies and all of those, you know, companies roll up through me. I'm, I'm getting credit for whatever they're selling. So it's not just, you know, what is my research? It's also what is their research and how can we align our messaging and have the whole, um, broader breadth and depth of Salesforce at play to solve their biggest challenges. So it's, it's a lot of internal prep and planning. It's not just me being a lone wolf. It's, it's a lot mm. of team selling, team coordination that goes into that. But 
I'd say just on the research and the messaging side, at least at least two, three hours per email that I send out. And then um, I'll follow that up by saying most people don't open their email, especially executives. So it's also finding their, their cell phone. Like, don't be afraid to call a, a, an executive cell phone. Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid to, um, you know, to, to follow up four times. It's amazing how executives appreciate you staying on top of them because they are so busy. And most yeah. salespeople, besides just falling short on the research, they'll fall short on the follow-up. And they, they don't want to piss someone off or they don't want to be too pushy. But if you know that you can help this business and you really can bring value, you have every right to lean on them because they are busy. And if you don't, someone else will, or mm-hmm. someone else will have their attention and your priorities, their priorities will not be um, centered around, around your, your product or service. So I think that's also key is like the, the, the follow-up um, can't be viewed as pestering or uh, annoying sales rep. It's got to be viewed as I have valuable time. And, and even um, recently there was a, a story I, 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 I sent an outreach to a COO of a big company and we we're trying to get this seven figure deal done. And, you know, he, he, he was identified as the person who had to approve everything and I hadn't mm-hmm. spoken to him. And, and so I sent him a really detailed message. I explained how, um, you know, what we were selling was very, very relevant to the times. And then I followed up and nothing. Right. And so I, I tracked down his cell phone, got a cell phone. He's like, call me at six. I can't talk now. And then at six, he spent over an hour with me talking to me about the solution. Then he says, go and send me an email with all these things. I want you to recap. I like what you have to say. I want, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I probably spent half a day putting that email together for him, which was video recordings of all the, the, I made demos of all the different things we were going to help him with um, on my own. I didn't wait around for someone else because speed, speed is key, right? When you have momentum, you got to keep it. And so I sent that to him and then it was like a week and a half later, he didn't respond. And in between that, that time, like, here's my thought. Okay. The, the, the time and the effort I put in to do half day workshop, to go create all this stuff, to listen to him, to take notes, to make it relevant, to change my proposal based on what he wanted. Okay. He needed to see that. So mm-hmm. my next meeting was set up time with him to review this stuff in detail. And so I call, I probably called him two or three times. I texted him and I emailed him within that week and a half before he got back to me. I wasn't pestering. He was the one who said, send me this, then we could set up a time, send me this first. So all I'm doing is uh, holding him accountable to what he said. Well, a week and a half later, he writes back and he's like, I am so sorry. It took me this long to get back to you, Ian. I love what you have to share. I watched the videos. It just took me a while because we're meet, moving 20,000 employees to work from mm-hmm. home. And I've been, I mean, I've been busy. So, so you got to respect kind of where they're at as well. Right. Um, but here's what I want you to do. I want, to, I want us to move quickly. I want you to work with these people to get a project manager on this. And if you can negotiate in this area, we can move very quickly. Um, and then he copied in his team that he wanted me to work with. I mean, it was the best email you could have gotten. So now uh, that, that deal is well on its way. And it's just something that is a testament to the power of not being afraid to pick up the phone and track down an executive. And when you do, you've got to make sure you're, you're straight to the point, you're direct, you are, are, are valuable and because execs don't want this generic bullshit. They don't want the, mm-hmm. oh, we can do X, Y, and Z. We help your productivity and we can increase your sales, but blah, blah, blah. Okay, no. They want to know, here's what you're, we, what I've been researching and working with you for this long. Here's what your company is struggling with. Here's how we can help. We need your blessing because we're having some trouble getting an executive to sponsor this. It's not moving. And based on what you said in this video, I know this can help you. And, and it was just... I mean, it was so nail. So I, I, I know I'm speaking a mile a minute and sharing a lot, but that's just uh-huh. one story that goes to the power of, of um, you know, personalized messaging, follow-up and, and relevance because people stop after like the third or fourth communication and you can't. That was probably the seventh before the guy came back. And that was after he had already told me to email him and get him the information. So you just got to, right. when you have the right um, fish on the hook, you got to reel it in. Mm. Yeah, no, that's an incredible story. Um, so t- take me back for a second. I want to just go back to something you said, right? So you said, you know, when you first got to Salesforce, you, you, you failed a lot in your first three, three years or so there, right? Yep. Before you had that kind of shift of spending more time on less people. 
Mm-hmm. What, what, what catapulted you into that mind shift? Was, did, was there somebody there that took you under their wing or how did you come to that realization? Like, Hey, what I'm doing is just not working and, and, and discovering this kind of newfound way of doing things for you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I still remember, you know, I, I, I had in my first year at Salesforce, I actually hit my number. So I hit it doing all that activity. And I happened to, I would say, get lucky because I was so persistent. I found a client, it was a hospital and that was, you know, I overachieved my plan. And that was a really, um, actually it was, it was a, a bad um, lesson because it told me that what I was doing was working. Right. <laughs> and I just had to do the activity. So it was positive reinforcement for the wrong, wrong behavior. So it, it was the years after that, that really started to, um, to change. So I kept doing that activity and I ended up, I think I was like 50 or 60% of plan, you know, the next couple of years or 70, it, w- it wasn't good. And that's, that's mm-hmm. for damn sure. It wasn't mm-hmm. good at all. And I, I, you know, worked for um, a manager at the time who wasn't into development and didn't give me much guidance. And, you know, I decided, you know, I need to leave uh, Salesforce. So I started interviewing at Microsoft and some other competitors. Uh, and before I decided to leave, I, I reached out to uh, the commercial division, which, which was run by a woman named Jen Legale. She's now our senior vice president and she's a rock star. And I said, Jen, I, you know, I'm working so hard. I'll do whatever it takes. But maybe I'm in the wrong division. You know, maybe this enterprise thing isn't for me. Um, and, and I'm better suited for like transactional because the commercial had a lot more accounts and it was more activity based and more at bats. And so I, I actually gave up on enterprise and I went to commercial and, and she gave me an opportunity. And that was the year where I literally fell short. I worked my ass off. I was working so hard and I fell short by, I ended up finishing like 96% of quota that year. And in, in that moment, the very last day of that year, um, when I, when I missed my quota, I remember it was like 11:50 PM and I had a DocuSign out to a client. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the short story. The client was in China. He hadn't worked with us. The company said all day I was at their office and they said, we're signing today. You just need to get the president's approval and we'll meet with the president. So I'm with the president of the company. Everything's going good. And she's like, I got to call China. My CIO is in China and that Chinese guy wasn't picking up. And, and that would have put me over my plan. And he was on vacation with his family and I managed to track him down and he, he got so mad because he was on vacation and I was telling him he had to sign something he hadn't even seen yet. And he's like, Ian, it doesn't, I can't, I don't work this way. I'm sorry. And he clicked. And, and I was in my room at that moment when he hung up and I, I remember just this feeling of like despair, this hopelessness. And I was so just devastated. And at this point in my life, uh, Colin, my, my self-worth was being derived from my performance. So if I wasn't mm. selling or hitting my goals or performing at work, I felt like a failure. And I think this is a problem in sales that a lot of people are faced with. They think they're only as good as their quota attainment. And, and uh, I was certainly in that place. And so at that moment, I said, you know, I, I don't know what, well, I don't know, but I do know I need help. So I just kind of let go. And I said, that was the first time I ever said, I don't know what I'm doing because this was three years in a row. I missed my plan. And I decided to enroll in a program uh, called Epic Impact. I invested uh, $20,000 of my own money. And uh, they said, we're going to promise you sales results. You're going to increase your sales and you're going to be happier in life. And I took a leap of faith and I went to a seminar. Um, uh, It was a three-day seminar and these guys did not talk about how to sell. They talked about your mindset and they talked about having a vision and they talked about um, truly tapping into part of yourself that was hungrier than ever before from a place where you need to go out. And, um, you know, for me, it was, it was my, my entry into personal development because the lesson that they taught was, was more about being authentic and helping people and serving people and um, truly, you know, just working from a place of love. And, and you know, I was working from a place of, of, of me and mm. my commission. And this is about me. And that shift is not just focused more on less people. That, that's not what the shift was. That's one aspect of the shift. The shift 
was moving from an inward sales motion to an outward sales motion. So all my focus is what's my agenda? What am I selling? What do I want to get out of this? What do I want to sell them? What my commission? What do I, and this Mm -hmm. shift was about what do you want? How can I help you? What is your goal? What is your challenge? What is your pain? Where do you need the most help? And, And then mapping backwards to that. So that's what that program taught me is how to really be empathetic and how to listen. And um, we went on four retreats that year. We did an international trip and it just really made me tap into this. Like, it's not all about me in letting go of the ego. And I still struggle with that, man. My ego is my worst enemy, but I I did let go that year. And I I made it about the client and I, I turned from a a transactional to a consultative sales rep. And that was the year I finished number one. That that year in 2017, I sold uh, almost 400% of plan. And, uh, and and it was by far my best year. And it was, it was almost coming from a place um, that was outside of me. It was like I was tapping into God. I was tapping into the love and the goodness inside of myself to serve people. And that's really how I've been selling the past three years. And I feel like that's what the market needs. That's why I'm so... Uh, adamant about posting videos and, mm-hmm. and you know going on these podcasts is you know people are so inward facing and they're so focused on their own goals. Well, that doesn't work because clients don't care what you know until they know you care about their business and mm-hmm. them. And so, really, my my questions shifted to um, what is your business trying to do and what are you going to do? What's in this for you and why did you come to this company? And really hit that personal level and then hit those. Um, company level type questions, your company goals and your personal goals. And the more you talk about someone else, the, the better, you know, the, the outcomes are going to be. So I just try and do less talking um, on, on my sales calls and more listening, more asking questions. And then when they're answering, kind of not just taking an answer and moving on to my agenda, but really kind of digging deep on that answer and, you know, okay, so what does that mean for you? Asking more impact questions. You know, what, what, what happens if you don't change that? You know, what, what does that mean to your employees? What about your customers? Okay, well, if you do change that, what, what would that look like? What, what, why is this important to you? Why is this important to you? That's the mm. number one question you could ask if you're in sales, right? Get to their why. Um, just like you need your own why to, to be successful, you also need to get to their why. So all of this, I won't say it was taught in the program I was in. I think what was taught was to really start caring about people instead of just caring about yourself. And to me, I mean, I'm still learning those lessons. I've been so, you know, my, my, this year has been with COVID and with, with everything going on. It's, it's really been a wake up call for me to step outside of my own ego and start caring more about my family and more about, I mean, the, the, the forced uh, isolation has really made me connect with my wife and my son in ways that I never done before and really face myself in some areas that I think I was um, shoving under the rug. So it, it's, it's an everlasting journey, but that that's, I'd say the biggest shift is, is letting go and saying, I don't know everything and I need help. So I, I signed up for this program. I got a mentor inside of Salesforce. That was one of the top reps. I approached him and said, Hey, I want to see what you're doing. Cause you're so good. And, and I, mm-hmm. I just started giving um, myself to others and in giving, I, I receive so much more. So I know there's a lot of cliches here, but it, it's really true. I mean, these are universal truths for a reason. And I'm walking living proof of what can happen if you, if you make this shift. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Thanks so much for sharing that about your personal journey. Right. So it sounds like it was really more of a, like a, like a inside job of really working on yourself personally to then perform better professionally. I think it's everyone's inside job. People want sales training for me. They want to know how to craft an email or how to do research or how to close business or handle objections. That's all bullshit. Okay. I will teach it as good as anyone, but the reality is if you don't do that inside work, if you don't truly Mm. dig deep and look at what's holding you back. And in my case, I was stubborn and I didn't want to learn a new way of doing things. Right. That was for me. But um, I think that's, I think that's common for a lot of sales professionals, right? Yeah. Especially ones that have done well, right? The ego is our worst enemy and you know, that's it's so a true. But look at our, look, look at where we are now versus 10 years ago, or even five years ago, our world is different. Technology has a different role. We're having this via zoom, right? Where our clients are, are 
business is moving faster than ever. Um, mm -hmm. Not in the past two months, but you yeah. know, for, before that, I mean, literally the, the technology yeah. shift and what what's happening in, in the market and, and people's ability to get information in the competitive landscape, you need to uh, adapt how you're selling and connecting with people oh, yeah. if you want to stay relevant. So I, I could not, could not survive and could not thrive if I just did what I was doing before. So that, that was really the big shift for me. That inside job uh, was, was what I needed because I, yeah. I had to let go and admit that I wasn't as good. And I, and I freaking people just go in and blame everything else. They blame the external, they blame the company, they blame the territory, they blame the manager. They don't look in the mirror and blame mm. themselves because that takes a lot of courage. And so yeah. I, I've, um, you know, unfortunately I've, I've had my ups and downs in life, right? I've, I've I've had, I've come from a family of, of addiction and I've had to look in the mirror in a lot of things my whole life. And it's just something that I, my, my father passed away very young and, and, mm. um, you know, and his lifestyle was something that I wanted to get away from, right? Because I didn't want to have the same, the same thing happen to me. So I think I, I did it a lot in my personal life for certain things, but I never really did it in my professional life until 2017. And, and that's when I, um, applied some of the principles that I always believe in, which is we can change, we can get better. Um, if, if we have faith, you know, um, God will, will provide for us. And, and if you, your heart is pure and your intentions are good, you will always have uh, opportunity come to you. So I, I'm, I'm on this, like I said, I'm on this mission of, of doing more than just teaching selling. It's, it's more yeah. about helping people um, live happier, fulfilling lives. Because I was, even though I was performing, I, I, I was certainly, um, I was certainly not happy, you know, for the bulk of my sales career because I was always chasing and chasing and I just never appreciated where I was. And I thought it was great because it just made me driven. I'm like, this is the way I'm wired, but that doesn't go away if you, if you can appreciate and enjoy the moment either. That drive will always be in there. It's just going to yeah. be channeled towards different things. So now it's channeled towards family and towards health and spirituality. And it's just such a, it's such a more fulfilling way to live for me. And I, I mean, I think the sales will be the entry to a broader purpose of like, how do you live a fulfilling life? Because um, I just think our society is plagued with this, this get ahead, keep up with the Joneses mindset. And it's really, um, it's really hard, especially in sales, because, you know, you're never going to get to where you want to go. And you're never going to feel fulfilled unless you can kind of be be where you are in some capacity. Mm, wow. Yeah, I think that you know, I think that a lot of sales professionals have that fear that like, you know, if they get too content, then that drive will go away. But you're saying that's not true. It, it, it gets channeled differently. It's not about going away. It's where do you want to put your drive? Do you want to be the best father you can be? Do you want to have a great relationship and a mm -hmm. great marriage? Do you want to have um, strong faith? Do you want to give back to your community and do service? Do you want to just work on closing your business and, and selling? I think if, if, if you, it's not about not having drive. It's about what sacrifices are you making in terms of being that good person, right? It, it's not, you can't be every, there's going to be sacrifices no matter what. So if, if you think for a second that, if you're not chasing, you're going to lose your ambition, then you're probably not an ambitious person to begin with. Okay. It's not about chasing. It's about setting goals that are more important than just your sales goals because right. your sales goals are fleeting. Mm -hmm. Your sales goals are annual. If you're, if you're only relying on your happiness or fulfillment based on hitting a number, what happens if you don't hit that number? What happens to the 70% of people mm -hmm. in sales that don't hit their number? Well, it's exactly right? what you said, right? You were tying your self-worth based on your attainment of goal. Totally, totally. And the irony is when you let go of that, because what happens is that creates this desperation. It's just, I have to call this person. I have to do this. I have to close this. And you're always mm. like frantic. You're always panicked. And yeah. I talk a mile a minute, but I'm, I'm not frantic. If I don't sell something this month, I don't care. And, and I know a lot of VPs of sales or CEOs would hate to hear that, but I will outperform every one of their salespeople when I want to. So it, it's, it's a matter of you need to be happy and fulfilled in life to be a top performer. You can't just, just perform and perform. You will burn out or you will, um, 
I don't know, man. I, I just, I have to, I have to believe at this phase in life that, that um, in order to be a good salesperson, you need to be a good person first. Yeah. You need to have the right foundation in place. And I feel like when I started putting that foundation in place and doing the inner work, um, that's when I became a really good salesperson. Otherwise you're just right. chasing deals and you're not, you're not caring about your clients. So, and, 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 and the clients, the, you know, the buyers are smarter. They, they can, they can smell that. They can smell oh. if you're in it for the commission or if you're really genuinely being authentic and trying to help. Yeah. That, and that's the key. So how do you teach someone to be authentic and try to help? That's, that's yeah. really what you're asking. And, and you have to, like I said, you've got to do the inner work. You know, you got to do, um, in, in addiction recovery, you know, the, the first step is admitting you're powerless, right? Admitting you don't know everything. The second step is, you know, saying God has the power, right? There's someone else. Maybe it's not God. Maybe it's a, a mentor. Maybe it's a, um, someone else who's training or teaching or the program that I was in. The third step is I'm going to turn myself over and, and, and let my ego drop. The fourth step is doing a moral inventory, right? When mm -hmm. you look at your um, character and, and your, your, your positives, but also your negatives, right? We're, we're talking about um, a character flaw in some cases, in a lot of cases with salespeople where they're willing to compromise their values and morals to get a deal. Mm -hmm. And that integrity, um, you know, is, is lacking. And, and if you're lacking integrity at work, you're lacking integrity in your personal life too. So I think, again, doing that work of truly saying, you know what, I'm honest, I care about my clients. I'm authentic. Mm -hmm. Is something that you have to do before you can be the best um, salesperson. Because if your only goal is money and success, you're going to stomp over everyone along the way to get there. And you're going to feel like a really, really sad human being. And it's all going to come back to you. And karma is a real thing. So I, I had my taste. Like I said, I've lived that side for the bulk of my sales career. And I, I didn't think anything was wrong. I thought I was just a great salesperson. But mm -hmm. I think I ran over people along the way. I think I um, certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example. When I was running Rico, I had 80 employees and one guy, um, I won't name names, but uh, his wife was going to give birth in a month and, and he wasn't performing. And I remember him sitting in my office crying to me as I told him he was going to be laid off saying, just let me keep my job for one more month. My wife is in the hospital. We need the benefits. And I said, I'm sorry, you know, you got to perform to do your job. And it was heartless. And I didn't care. It was like, he was a mm. number. He was just, he wasn't a person. And I think for, for leadership and, um, and sales and, and really any, any person who's dealing with people in, in their business, uh, if, you, if you look at people as a way to get what you want in using people, in, in terms of including looking at your customers as a way to get your commission and mm. your, your goal, um, that is, is really going to um, fall short of what God wants us to do, which is, which is serve people and help people. And so I, I, I fired this guy and I, I didn't shed a tear. And I, I still to this day can remember that because I could have said, you know what, I get it. You got to work. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to do these things. I'll keep you on the plan, but I need to see this progress. I'll give you one more month, get through your baby, do what you got to do. And, and that probably having that empathy and compassion probably would have help this guy perform at such a higher level than had I um, just said no. And, and that's like another lesson in leadership. I was in leadership for, for five years and ran a big team. And um, one of the big things was just like empowering people to, to really, um, to believe in them. You know, if you're a manager, if you, if you just tell people what to do versus showing them and letting them fly, letting them free, you're, you're going to get much better results. And when I had my two years that were, um, not well at Salesforce. I felt like I was just a number. I felt like this person, my manager didn't care about me at the time. Mm -hmm. It was really, really hard. And that makes a huge difference. Like, you know, you got to care about your clients if you're in sales. And if you're a sales manager or VP, you have to care about your people and their well being. And, and they you know, know, and they know whether you care or not. They know whether they you're treating them like a number or you really care about them on a, you know, authentic personal level. Totally. But that's like what life is, man. It's about connecting. It's about caring. It's about loving. It's like, I, I, I might sound a little bit, you know, um, spiritual or religious, but I'm not. I was raised Jewish. I'm just learning about Christianity and what God wants. And this is all new for me right mm -hmm. now, but it's the kind of my next level is like, how can I live, you know, the way God intended me to live and, and not the way man and ego and the world tells you to live. And it's just, I've been doing it a short while and it's just so much more fulfilling and I'm so much happier when I go to bed at night yeah. knowing I'm, I'm not hiding anything, knowing that 
you know, I'm, I'm helping people and you know what? So what if I'm not selling? That's not the purpose. The sales will come, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's about truly like taking time out for this is a perfect example because I know your listeners will get value and I know my listeners will get value. And it's, it's really important that people take this message that it's not all about the number. It's about, you know, your, your fulfillment. It's about being the best version of you you can be. And if you're just pressuring on the number, the performance, the revenue goal, whatever it is, you're going to miss the, the bigger picture and you're not going to, you know, um, you're going to be desperate to the client and you're going to have an energy of, uh, of, of scarcity that, that clients don't want to be with. Whereas if you can play the long game and work on their timeline and, you know, you still have to create urgency, you still have to create compelling events and stuff. But at the end of the day, you, you need to understand where they're at, how they work and work with them as a member of their team versus like pushing something unnatural on them. And I think mm-hmm. that's where the salespeople feel really slimy and gross is when they're trying to push their timeline, their deal clients know better. So I just let all that, that stuff go. And I said, you know what, let's have a heart to heart. What do you need to do? How can I help walk me through this? And when I, when I've taken that approach, it is amazing how yeah. much more receptive clients have been. And that's, what's been the key to my success. It, it's, it's so much about authentically connect, connecting and helping as it is the work ethic and the skills and you don't even need the skills. If you're, you're truly, you know, trying to help people, they'll see that and the skills will come. So, yeah. Yeah. And also being okay with the fact that if you're not the right fit to help them or totally. it's not the right time to help them and not taking that personally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's not personal. It's not personal because, because there are going to people who want your help. And by the way, a lot of people, I haven't had somebody who said, I don't want your help, Ian. I really haven't. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm batting 100%. Um, it's, it's the wrong people that don't want my help. The right people, that's why I sell the executives. The executives care about their business. It's the managers, the, you know, the people on the ground sometimes that are just in their lane focused on their business. They're not going to care about the revenue of the company or the retention of the employees. They're going to care about their project and what their boss is asking to do. So that's where... When you're selling to executives, you you gotta look at the big picture, and that's why all that research helps. So I yeah. I just like I'll, I'll say this: it's it's not a given because people don't do it. But getting to power it, it is as important as anything else I've shared on this podcast. Any any um the, what I wasn't doing before is I was spending time in that middle lower level. Well, you you have one conversation with COO that can save six months of work or one conversation with the CFO, you know what's important to them, you know what they want, and then you can quote that and reference that for the rest of your sales cycle and then come back to them with, hey, here's how I helped you with what you told me you know, a few months ago. So that's, that's really, I think, um, the people that want the help are the ones that uh, are at the top of the food chain in their organizations versus lower, lower level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. All right. So uh, let's, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, tell you a little bit about what we do here at Monster VoIP. We help companies save 30 to 50% off their current business phone bill while providing them more value and more features. If you'd like to learn more, you can text us at 424-378-6966. Ian, we have covered a lot. Um, and I want to wrap it up with telling people a little bit how they could use, you know, telling stories um, and the power of focus to drive sales. Yeah. So with storytelling, I mean, it's real simple, right? If you think about a story, you have the hero of the story, you have the villain, you have, um, you know, the, the build up to, to the climax of the story. And then you have the, the resolution and in Hollywood and Pixar and, you know, uh, any, any person who writes a book or, or produces a movie has the same format. So what I've done is I've taken that same format and applied it to how I deliver my proposals. So I introduce the characters. Here's John. He's the CFO. He wants this. Here's the CIO. And then here's the pain and the challenges. Here's your current situation. You want this, but you can't get this because here's what's stopping you. And I'll list out all the quotes and the pain points and all the challenges from their interviews. And then I say, but in comes comes John. I'll make the customer the hero, right? In comes John to save the day. And he has this plan. And here's how you're going to solve these issues. And it's not, you're not saving the day. Salesforce is the vehicle, but the customer is really the hero, right? So I'll say John's bringing in Salesforce and here's what he's going to do with it and literally make his um, story the center. And, and then, and then the, the resolution will be um, Salesforce. So Salesforce, 
you know, many customers have done this before. Here's some stories of other successful customers. Here's the implementation plan that we have. Um, all we need to do is uh, get these contracts started. And here's the ROI that you'll expect to receive. And, and then that's kind of the, the resolution is they, they close the deal and they live happily ever for ever after. So <laughs> it's really about, it's really about introducing the character. What's the pain that they have today? Um, why aren't they able to hit that vision or why is that vision not being executed? Um, and then how, how can you and them together co-create, um, you know, a, a solution that, that can solve this. And, and, and then um, I, I kind of have a template that I use for, for delivering that. And it, and it follows the, the story template of, of uh, a lot of other, um, a lot of, you know, motion pictures. And, and I just apply it to selling. It's been, it's been really effective. Yeah. I'd love to get my hands on that template. I can share it. <laughs> I, it's one of my, actually, it's one of my uh, courses that I'm going to be um, delivering once I, once I do this, this full time. I'll, I'll have to get on the waiting list. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and we're just, we're out of time. I think we went a little over, but I think it's totally okay because there's a lot of value packed into our conversation. Um, but before I let you go, tell us a little bit more about where people can find you. If they have questions, if they want to learn more about, you know, some things that you're doing. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, so the best place to find me is on LinkedIn. I post a video every week. It's a sales training video, most motivational video. Uh, that's Ian Koniak, I-A-N, last name K-O-N-I-A-K. -K. You look me up there and um, you can shoot me a DM. Uh, you can also go to ianconiak.com and that's where I have my blog post and my uh, newsletter that I send out where you can subscribe and get weekly tips every week to your inbox. You can also find me on YouTube if you search Ian Koniak. So I'm on the social platforms. I'm not on Instagram anymore. I was, but it's not really my audience and who I'm targeting. So I'm spending time focusing on where the B2B uh, sales you know, professionals in, in companies are. So I'll be, I'll be on that. I will be releasing a course next year on strategic selling um, and, and I'll have a membership portal for, for people who, who want coaching and training from me. It's not something I'm doing yet because I am at Salesforce right now, but eventually it will be something I do full time and excited to you know, support you guys in, in your own training and development and, and getting you to your, your perform at your highest potential. So yeah, I appreciate, appreciate that plug, Colin. Yeah. Awesome. Ian, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, welcome to the Monster Chats community. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, share, and we are open to hearing your feedback. The show is all about you and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for awesome. tuning in for another episode of Monster Chats presented by Monster Voip, where we share the tools, methods, and best practices that business leaders use to build new connections, strengthen relationships, and impact sales in organizations of all shapes and sizes. If you have any questions from today's show and want to reach us directly, please text your question to 424-378-6966.